Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goldstein as she discusses this important new work with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the whole chat in the Stacks team. I know there's quite a few of you, and um, I've been so impressed by your organizational skills putting this talk together. So thank you for the invitation. Um, for everyone online, thank you for being here. And everyone who's here in the room, thank you for making time to come. I know it's an exceptionally busy um, time on campus with a lot of talks. So I really appreciate it, and I hope to make it worth your uh, pleasurable hour. First of all, what I would like to do is acknowledge my co-editor, Eric Noss. Um, as mentioned, he's an assistant professor at the University of Guelph. This is a completely joint project, co-edited, co-written, co-organized. The labor was completely shared. Um, so I'm really speaking on behalf of both of us today and really on behalf of all of the con contributors that I had to this, uh, we've had to the book, right? There's 15 empirical chapters in this book. Um, it's quite difficult to know how to present on an edited volume of such breadth and depth. Um, and I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them, of course, but I just would like to acknowledge all of their contributions. This was definitely not a solo project um, for me. And I should say, as you mentioned, um, I was a postdoc here at, at Cornell. And this project actually started when I was an Atkinson postdoc uh, in 2016, 2017 in the Science Technology Studies Department. Um, at the time, I was really interested in this idea of critical remote sensing. Um, and I'll mention a little bit later, if you're not familiar with remote sensing, what that is. But I got interested in, in digital and data technologies around that time. Um, and just a little backstory on how this book came to be. A lot of people ask me, why did you work on an edited volume? Because the sort of tagline in academia is never do an edited volume. <laughs> um, there are a lot of work, right? And there's a kind of perception you don't always get credit for them. So we were really swimming upstream, I think, to get this book uh, put together and organized. I, I, I should say, without shame, that we had four presses reject our proposal before we had one accept it. Um, the University of Nebraska was very generous in working with us and really excited about the project. And um, this contributes to their sort of emerging series on digital geographies as well. So it was quite attractive for them. So if it's a topic you're interested in, I would say check out some of their other books. Um, so I met Eric at a conference. He gave a really brilliant talk uh, when I was a postdoc. And I, he was actually still a graduate student. And I saw him and I said, I want to work with that guy. He's talking about the things I've been thinking about, but he's doing it way more articulately than me. Um, so I pulled him in and kind of pushed this forward, and he um, he was game. So I'm really appreciative that he was willing to join me on this adventure um, of book publication. So both Eric and I are trained in political ecology. Um, it's a subfield of kind of geography, anthropology. Um, so we were already sort of speaking the same language, right? We had read the same things. So coming together to work on that was not too difficult. And that is the conceptual framing of the book, right? It's very much situated within the fields of political ecology. Um, but of course, draw, drew in contributors from anthropology, ecology, science and technology studies, um, uh, yeah, and a couple of other sort of interdisciplinary fields as well. Um, so just to give you an overview of the talk, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the introductory chapter, which Eric and I co-wrote, um, which will give you an overview of the kind of key points of the book and the project we're laying out. Um, I'll just really briefly mention a couple of the empirical chapters, and then I'll spend a little bit more time talking on one of the empirical chapters that I co-authored um, with actually an alum of our program, Hillary Faxon, um, and then just a kind of brief conclusion. So that's where we're going. So let's begin with some observations, right? So this is really where our project started, right? Was looking at how increasingly our relationships with nature are digitally mediated, right? Recognizing that um, there's a lot of technology, right, sort of out there in the world. Um, and by our, we're really referring to the ways that governments, corporations, NGOs, conservationists, scientists, right, are in relationship with nature. Um, but this can also refer to individuals, right? All of those bodies I've mentioned are made up of individuals, of course. But as political ecologists, we're always looking to institutions, right, to kind of understand, like, how are they responding to environmental change and how are they shaping the environment? Um, so most contemporary environmental challenges, right, ranging from climate change adaptation, biodiversity loss, control and access of natural resources, um, including fossil fuels, timber, minerals, the kind of big, big problems, right, are now all mediated by digital technology. I would say pretty much without exception in some capacity. Um, so by digital technology, you know, this could be anything from very sophisticated big data, you know, big data sets from artificial intelligence, data dashboards. It could also be the quite rudimentary you know, smartphone apps that um, somebody without a kind of robust internet connection and a very basic smartphone would be able to use, especially in the global south. Um, so what we're referring to, these sort of digital mediation of nature, this is definitely true in the global north, right? So North America and Europe, but it's increasingly true in the global south, right? So, in, you know, throughout the rural 
parts of the tropics, um, quite poor areas, places that don't even have like road access to villages, for example, in rural areas now have uh, smartphones and access to cell phone towers and data, right, and are often kind of running their lives through their smartphones in the absence of some of these other infrastructures. Um, so this also goes far beyond science and research, right? If you're a scientist or a researcher yourself and you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, yeah, we've been using technology like this for, for years, for decades, right, of course. Um, but this is really extended into the realm of state development programs, of transnational NGOs, aid, aid organizations. They are also using algorithms and smartphone apps, cryptocurrency, um, blockchain to intervene in land and resource conflicts and distribute aid money, um, and even monitor environmental degradation right in places that they might be working. Um, so for instance, a couple of examples, the UN World Food Program uses blockchain to distribute food aid to refugees in the Middle East. Um, USAID, who, you know, our kind of US development organization works all around the world, has replaced cash transfers with smartphone apps in Vietnam. Um, and that's a way to provide payments for ecosystem services, uh, which is a type of conservation practice. Um, conservation donors in the US can use QR codes and GPS coordinates and drone photos to verify that trees they've planted in Madagascar by way of donations are still standing, right? So a sort of verification that your donation is still okay, right, if you've participated in a tree planting program on the other side of the world. Um, so these digital technologies are not just a convenient way to transfer money, right? Our conceptual observation um, is that drawing on our training as political ecologists is that they're indicative of a shift in access, and to, in access and control over the environment and data about the environment, right? So this is really the starting point for wanting to work on this project, is that there's something, you know, observing that there's something going on here, right, that's actually affecting the material world, and it has to do with changes of how data and data infrastructures, which I'll talk about, mediate the environment, but they too are becoming controlled and accessed in ways that are really important to try to understand. Um, so for several decades, remote sensing data, which is land cover, land use data collected via satellites, um, was really expensive and difficult to process, right? This has been going on since the 50s. It was, you know, born out of a Cold War era kind of use of satellites to observe Earth phenomena at a distance. Um, but typically, it was only available to governments that could afford it and to scientists who could also afford it and had the expertise to process it and analyze it. Um, but this has really changed, right? So even though the data, right, coming from satellites or airplanes that are um, equipped with sensors to measure kind of reflected electromagnetic imagery, which is kind of what comprises remote sensing data, um, this is used to gather geospatial data about land cover from space. But in the past decade, maybe 10 to 15 years, a lot of this data and the data platforms through which this data is collected, um, circulated and accessed, is now open source and, and publicly available, right? So people who don't have the capacity to either pay for it or to understand how to process it can still access data platforms and actually make use of some of this data sort of after it's already been analyzed for them. Um, so some examples of this. Uh, so for example, I think a pretty well-known one, maybe some of you have heard of the humanitarian um, open street map, which has become a really large project in the last uh, decade or so. Um, they make it really easy for non-experts to access their data, right? So this is a volunteer-run organization. Um, that maps areas, especially after disasters such as earthquakes and floods, right, and is able to kind of target even down to a neighborhood level who might need aid, right, and how to distribute it. And they have people working both on the ground and using remote sensing data to actually map, you know, where the most affected areas are. Um, Global Forest Watch is actually the, the project that got me interested in this idea of critical remote sensing. So this was kind of, this was released in 2014 by the World Resources Institute. Um, it's an online platform. It's very easy to use. Um, even if you don't know anything about deforestation or remote sensing, anyone can really go here and start to play around with data layers. Um, it displays deforestation in near, near real time. Um, and these projects that we're talking about is, are really about participation as much as observation, right? So they really encourage you to go into the websites, start adding your own data layers, maybe start drawing some of your own conclusions. You can have um, some of the data sent to you on a daily basis if you want to observe it. Like you might track your airline flight prices, you know, something like that. Um, and this is also really significantly indicative of a move towards increasing count accountability and transparency, right? As part of a broader kind of push towards good governance, um, inclusive participation and risk reduction more broadly. So this trend, of course, this sort of trend towards good governance and the understanding that increased transparency and accountability through data infrastructure has really significant extensions and implications for environmental politics. 
Okay, so at the heart of this turn towards digital mediation of environmental politics are what Eric and I have called data infrastructures. So this is really the core analytic concept of our book. Um, and what we're referring to in a kind of most basic sense is the material, hardware, and software devices such as servers, satellites, sensors, smartphones, smartphone apps, online platforms, algorithms, and any kind of models, online models, um, that enable people to generate and analyze environmental data. Uh, that's a non-exhaustive list. I'm sure people in this room probably have other examples of what would comprise uh, data infrastructures. So these data infrastructures inform environmental management at a local and regional and global scales. Um, but they also, and I think this is a really key insight of the book, they are themselves controlled and regulated and also incentivized in ways that are not neutral, but are instead imbued with politics. Um, so the chapters in this book all explore the making and maintaining and um, effects of these data infrastructures in particular places um, to show how conservationists, corporations, scientists, governments, development practitioners, community members um, are generating actionable but very uneven knowledge about the environment through these data infrastructures. So through these case studies, the 15 body chapters of the book that I've mentioned, um, and the book as a whole, we um, conceptually advance what we're calling a political ecology of data, right? So a sort of new subfield that we're encouraging kind of people to think about, to use conceptually, to find their own projects um, that fit within this kind of, I guess, scholarly conversation. Um, and this begins with the premise that we can't understand the current conjuncture in environmental politics without understanding the role of data and data infrastructures in shaping control and access to the environment. So that's really the key kind of claim we're working with here. Um, so some background on political ecology, if you're not familiar with the field. Um, political ecology really draws on a long-standing kind of normative commitment to making visible how political economic structures and institutions shape how knowledge about the environment is created and whose perspectives are considered legitimate. Um, so we're also drawing from science and technology studies, which has really kind of over a long term shown that knowledge production depends on socio-technical infrastructures. Um, and those in turn require embodied, located practices and devices, both proprietary and open source. Um, so many socio-technical infrastructures, and this is a key contribution from this um, STS literature, is that things are, you know, a lot of things that we have in our daily lives are ubiquitous, but they're invisible, right? So things that we take for granted, like fiber optic cables, geographic information systems, if you open Google Maps on your phone, right? These are all overlaid on these kind of invisible but very crucial infrastructures that we are kind of using and relying on in our everyday life. Often we only notice them when they don't work, right? Um, and all of these things are also deliberately built and maintained, which is another kind of crucial piece to understand infrastructure, right? It's kind of a not, it's not a neutral background, um, but it's something that people are actively working on every day to make sure they can kind of be running. So we draw on this kind of, these insights from STS alongside other work done by scholars um, studying the digital realm to show that these data infrastructures that generate knowledge about the environment are themselves sources of contestation, right? So not just that the data is producing any kind of conflict or contestation, but the data infrastructures are actually at the heart of some contestation themselves. So two further kind of arguments we make in the introduction. Um, about how data infrastructures mediate socio-environmental relationships. Um, one, data infrastructures are unevenly produced and consolidated, um, kind of building on what I just said. So what, do I, what exactly do I mean by this, right? So, so for one, corporate and government investment in data infrastructures deepen the asymmetries in whose expertise is valued by rooting knowledge production and application through models that they own um, software and hardware, which they built and designed for their own purposes, a lot of which is proprietary, um, and a lot of which is for profit, right? So sometimes even publicly accessible open source, um, you know, data infrastructures are still part of a for profit enterprise, or they're they have like one arm available to make it kind of non profit, while the other side of the company is doing it for profit. So the second claim that we're making here is that data infrastructures mediate socio environmental flows. Right, so this is some kind of political ecological jargon we could say for things like cars and carbon and wildlife and water um, are the socio-environmental flows, right? So the data infrastructures are actually changing and in some ways we're making some of these material pieces of the environment. Okay, so why infrastructure? Um, if you're in the social sciences, you're probably thinking, well, of course infrastructure, or you're thinking, oh God, not more infrastructure, right? It could be one or the other. So, 
Um, this has become a pretty trendy concept, I would say, in most social sciences. Um, so we gave a lot of thought to whether we really needed to use it, right? Were we just like writing the trend or did we have some kind of um, you know, conceptual investment in, in actually deploying this as an analytical framework for a book? Um, so we decided, of course, that we needed it, right? We thought it was a good investment to, to kind of double down on infrastructure. Um, and really that's because it's hard to ignore when you're looking at environmental data, right? For some of the reasons I just said. So of course the digital realm might appear to be immaterial and invisible, um, but it's always made possible by physical and tangible infrastructure. Um, so political ecologists have for a long time studied things like pipelines or canals, energy grids, road access, right, in much the same way. We decided to take that same kind of empirical lens and look at the nuts and bolts of the digital realm um, to really shed light on how this realm kind of makes environmental politics possible. Um, so all of the data from your laptops and smartphones, right, even though we don't really think about it, it's stored somewhere that's connected to an actual place, right? For instance, the cloud servers that store data um, run through centers that require 24-7 power. They require water as cooling, um, kind of a cooling mechanism, and they have really considerable carbon footprints. Um, companies have made pledges to offset some of this energy use. So Google and Amazon, for example, um, have bought things like forest carbon offsets to offset the kind of environmental footprints of their data centers. And those in turn have other material impacts, right, on other places in the world. Um, so the fact that data centers, right, is just one example, um, use land and water, that is not an insignificant effect on those places, right, and the socio-environmental relationships um, where those servers and um, centers are located. So the second reason we decided that infrastructure was actually useful for us is that it draws from um, an STS scholar, Susan Lee Starr's work on infrastructure as practice, or what she called infrastructuring. Um, so this is really a way to make visible the politics that data um, make available for use, right? So by politics here, we're referring to demands, redistributions, conflicts, visibilities um, that arise through knowledge production. So seeing data in terms of infrastructure as a practice and not just a thing, um, raises the important question of whom and for what is data, is environmental data for? Um, so this brings me to a final key kind of argument that we make in the introduction, which is that data about the environment is not simply collected or found, um, but it's made. And, you know, depending on where you kind of sit within environmental data knowledge production, this might seem really obvious to you, or it might be um, not quite so obvious, right? So making this claim allowed us to push back on this idea that, um, data is out there ready to be kind of harvested, right? This notion like these kind of hegemonic, increasingly hegemonic understandings of data as being raw, right? Where data can be found, it can be sold, it can be commodified, right? And it's just sort of waiting out there for companies or individuals or even scientists to collect it and use it, right? For their own purposes. And we're really saying, no, it's not, that's not what's happening here, right? All data is inherently made and produced, right? It's not raw. Um, and it's never free of politics, right? That's the other kind of key key piece of that claim. So we're really speaking back to data-driven environmental governance um, in which data is increasingly understood as a direct input for decision making, um, or that it, could, it can make the process of translating science into policy more expeditious, right? This is kind of the, the, the dominant narrative, um, narratives that we were observing, um, especially among development agencies and states and corporations. So our goal here with the political ecology of data is ultimately to show that there are political, economic, and socio-technical um, arrangements that enable this data to drive environmental governance and to inform, inform environmental politics. And this goes far beyond the kind of normal application of scientific expertise, right? That again, used to inform the kind of uses of this data. So contributors to this uh, book advance this claim by disrupting promises that data infrastructures are the only solution to governance problems. Authors ask us to take revolutionary discourses um, about data's potential to, quote, save the environment with a grain of salt. Um, so this is not to say data is always harmful, right, or is not doing anything good, but it's really just to say, is it, right, to raise the question from the beginning rather than kind of accepting at face value that it's always going to be good and, and for everybody. Um, so some of the authors put forth um, examples of the ways that data infrastructures are designed with positive social change in mind, which I thought was a really exciting uh, way to incorporate these kind of social justice oriented frameworks. It's not just kind of calling for them, but they actually documented how this is happening in practice, um, rather than just reproducing kind of extractive ways of relating to the environment. Okay, 
So there are three kind of core sections to the book, um, four to five chapters in each. Again, I wish I could go into detail about all of them, but they all deserve their own, you know, 45 minute talk, so I'm not gonna, not gonna do that today. Um, so the first section, sensors, servers, and structures. Um, this section takes a political ecology approach to digitally mediated environmental change by looking really closely at the materiality of data flows um, and the infrastructures I've been referring to. So just a few examples. Um, some of the things I find most interesting in this section. So Graham Pickering discusses how an old industrial bakery building in Chicago has been re repurposed um, as a data center, which is placing Chicago at the hub of a kind of global information economy. Um, and he really shows that the use of high frequency trading, which demands a lot of data, which in turn demands a lot of data center space, right, is, is a, a kind of like pivotal shift in the financial services industry, right? So if you can imagine the old stock trading floors where people would kind of cry out and make trades, has shifted to online, right? And these trades are run by algorithms and they happen in fractions of seconds. So the fact that those things are happening in fractions of seconds to advance capital accumulation, right, for investors, again, requires a huge amount of data and new data centers. So he kind of goes through the whole process of um, how this kind of process has been, you know, has reappropriated some of the old industrial structures from past forms of commodity production. Um, Luis Alvarez Leon has a fantastic chapter about the political economic shifts in the satellite industry, basically showing how it's moved from state-owned satellites mostly to satellites launched by private companies, um, of, case, of course, in most cases, for-profit companies, and what this means for Earth, in, um, uh, Earth imagery. So the second section of the book we call Civic Science and Community-Driven Data. Um, so chapters in this uh, section look at the practices, so this kind of infrastructuring piece I was talking about, practices of data collection, storage, and analysis. Um, showing how deliberate knowledge production can push back against state and corporate objectives and instead potentially, not always, but potentially advance social justice goals for more inclusive and democratic participation. So this is particularly in ways that allow communities to have more control over the data and data infrastructures that produce and shape knowledge about their own land and resources. Um, I think the best example of this is the chapter by M. Uh, M. V. Etzel. Um, and her colleagues in Zimbabwe. She had a very large team of co-authors. I couldn't fit them all in. Um, but she details the process by which she actually designed a collaborative land use model in Zimbabwe that reflected the needs of the community, um, which had typically been dispossessed of their land. But by building a new land use model to incorporate actual kind of patterns of land ownership, they were able to present that to the local government and say, you know, we have a different picture of land use change than what you have typically been relying on. Um, the other chapter I think is really important is uh, Don Walker, who's part of the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, we call EDGY. Um, they put out a lot of papers elsewhere as well. It's a fairly large research group. Um, they documented how they, quote, rescued the US EPA data that they believed was at risk of disappearing from the internet when the Trump administration came to power. So if you remember in 20, I guess early 2017, when Trump, the Trump administration took over the federal government, the EPA was kind of replaced. They replaced all their scientists with these kind of, uh, you know, people who were not quite scientists, let's say, and were using a lot of anti-science rhetoric. So EDGY does things like go in and basically scrape all the data from those websites and store it, right? So they would have a repository in case the EPA actually did um, erase all of it from their websites. Um, so things are complicated, of course, right? Um, not all of these projects work perfectly, right? And I think that's kind of the beauty of showing the actual process of trying to collaborate around some of these things. I think for anyone who actually does collaborative work um, around data or around modeling, they're a really useful example to think about how you could incorporate some of the same principles um, into your own work. Um, and then the third section of the book, Governing Data, Infrastructuring, Land, and Resources. Um, so these chapters highlight the contradictory role that data plays in contemporary resource governance, right? So this is basically observing that on one hand, we have a rise in authoritarian and anti-science governments that have come to power around the world. Um, and they're often justifying their actions, right, through appeals to nationalism, kind of proto-fascism, um, or racism. Um, and the dominant scientific response has been to kind of double down on producing more and better data, right, with this kind of implicit assumption that if you have kind of objective and neutral data free of politics, it'll be sufficient to counter these kind of anti-science rhetoric and claim, you know, rhetoric and practices. Um, so of course, as these chapters are showing, it's much more complicated, right? This doesn't always work. 
Um, governments, NGOs, and the private sector have kind of all grappled with how data infrastructures can support environmental management and ecological research. Um, so a couple of examples from this section before I talk about uh, my own chapter. Um, Madeline Fairbarn and Xenia Kish's chapter investigates the digital extension services that companies are providing to farmers in the global south. They're particularly interested in a kind of post-green revolution Africa. Um, and they're concerned that data privacy issues with these services, um, as well as the potential for digital extension work, might shift profits away from farmers into the private sector. So basically deepening the inequalities that some of the data providers and digital extension services are, are promising to, um, to ameliorate. Um, James Blair has a fascinating argument around a penguin tracking project in the Falkland Islands. This is a small British overseas territory off the coast of Argentina. Um, and he shows that the scientists who went there to basically fill data gaps of penguins, right, so conservationists, um, ended up kind of inadvertently working with the state and with oil companies um, who then used their data infrastructures to monitor, both to monitor the penguin populations, but also to add to territorial claims that advance oil extraction. Um, definitely recommend checking, uh, checking that chapter out. So I'd like to spend um, some of the remaining time talking about the empirical chapter that I co-authored with Hillary Faxon. Um, as I think I mentioned, she's an alum of our PhD program in development sociology. She's now a professor at the University of Montana. Um, so this chapter came out of our kind of both longstanding research in Southeast Asia. She's worked in Myanmar. I've primarily worked in Indonesia. Um, I also took several trips to Myanmar before the coup in 2021, um, made it basically unsafe and impractical to continue to do research there. So we spend most of the chapter taking a really wide view of Southeast Asia. Um, so this region, if you're not really familiar with it, is a, has a really wide variety of political, uh, political governance systems, um, ranging from democratic, like Indonesia, to autocratic, military junta ruled, right, which is Myanmar currently. Um, and it also includes some of the world's most important biodiversity. You could refer to them as biodiversity hotspots. And it has really widespread um, internet and smartphone use, even in places without basic infrastructure, such as roads or electricity. Um, so the kind of questions we wanted to raise in this chapter, there's really three, three questions we're asking here. Um, so the first one is, how exactly do digital infrastructures contribute to illicit activity surveillance? Um, and thus, how do they contribute to actually um, governing or kind of preventing some of these activities, right? So we were interested to find out whether um, digital environmental surveillance actually empower citizens to hold states accountable um, to protect natural resources in places where most Southeast Asian countries lack robust re legal enforcement, right? Um, so second, we ask whether data infrastructures that rely largely on remote data collection, um, again, via satellite-based remote sensing, as I mentioned before, um, does this reinforce a kind of top-down decision-making or does it allow for a more bottom-up inclusive management, right, of remote and often very inaccessible places. Um, and this is especially true in Myanmar now, right, where most people can't actually go to check out what's happening on the ground, so are increasingly relying on remote sensing and other remote, um, remote data collection. Um, second, or I, I think maybe third, <laughs> um, in countries with a history of ongoing presence of state violence, and this is pretty much all of the countries in Southeast Asia, um, do these data infrastructures offer an, op offer an opportunity for democratic participation, right? Or are they merely advancing these kind of older systems of surveillance and oppression um, that have always underpinned a lot of the authoritarian governments there? So throughout Southeast Asia, these new data infrastructures are being used to monitor environmental activities that are outside the law, right? So some examples of this would be small-scale gold mining in Indonesia and in the Philippines, opium production in Thailand, um, Laos, and Myanmar. Um, wildlife poaching pretty much throughout the region, but especially in Laos, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, and timber harvesting and tracking again throughout the entire region. So a lot of these new software platforms and smartphone apps have been introduced by governments and NGOs to promote um, information transparency and support what they call good environmental governance. Um, so the predominant method of monitoring environments kind of within this rubric is what we could call pixel-based approaches, right? So Again, using satellite data to monitor changes in land use that might suggest deforestation or mining activity, um, which you could use something like this, for example, Hutan Watch, which is a Malaysian NGO that actually uses the Global Forest Watch platform coupled with their own data layers to make it more sort of locally relevant um, for Malaysia. Um, and then 
you know, using finer scale data collected on the ground, right? So coupled with the kind of broader trends of deforestation, but then having people go to validate the findings and then use that information to kind of name and shame um, cul culprits. So a few other examples, this was a project that um, I actually don't know the status of it now given the, the situation in Myanmar, but this was Open Jade Myanmar, which we write about um, in the chapter. Um, so this was basically trying to uncover the exploitation, especially around labor, but also the environment that goes on in the jade industry in Myanmar. It's the largest uh, source of jade in the world. Most of it goes to China, and most of it is, um, if not illegal, it's sort of like bolstering the coffers of the political elites, right? And it has a lot of just kind of very exploitative um, labor practices. Um, another example, which we actually wrote about in the book, and then when I was kind of preparing for the talk, I found out that they had put out um, a really beautiful kind of new example of what I had been talking about. So it's good timing, they just put it out this year. So this is a, a brochure from the Global Initiative for the Transnational Organized Crime um, on tracking online wildlife trade. Um, so things like this are both, both showing that, you know, things like the wildlife poaching and trade is happening online, right, through social media posts, uh, through cryptocurrency exchange, but they're also trying to use social media and algorithms to try to stop some of this criminal activity. Um, so of course, remote sensing, you might be thinking, well, if you're, if you're familiar with remote sensing data, you might be thinking, um, well, small scale activity like selective logging is not really easily detectable, right, through something like remote sensing. Um, so in these cases, a lot of organizations, especially local ones, have been trying to fill these data gaps by rolling out kind of alternative technologies and smartphone apps. So a couple examples that we found were that conservation organizations have installed treetop um, acoustic monitoring devices that can detect chainsaw uh, and logging truck noises and then alert local rangers, right? Send them to the area if they find that there's some activity happening. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that rangers throughout Southeast Asia have really limited ability to try to stop or confiscate you know, the equipment, especially on the spot, right? So it's one thing to have the information, to have the data, it's another to be able to kind of use it. Um, so ultimately, of course, these are old resource problems, right? These are not new to Southeast Asia, they're not new to the world. Um, the ability of technology to solve them is, is quite limited, as we're kind of positing, especially in places where the internet connection um, can be very spotty, which despite having access and ownership over smartphones, you know, you might have a kind of internet access in a village and then you travel 30 miles away, right, to the forest and you've got no access, right? So in those cases, a lot of these platforms, technologies just simply don't work. Um, but the bigger issue here is that law enforcement is absent, right, in a lot of these spaces or worse, is complicit in a lot of these crimes, right? Um, so these data infrastructures we are kind of hypothesizing also risk criminalizing or recriminalizing the rural poor. Um, who often turn to these illicit activities um, in the absence of alternative livelihoods um, without focusing on the major drivers of environmental degradation, which are usually due to corporate and government um, activities. Um, at the same time, we found that having more data about illicit activities publicly available can help journalists or human rights organizations um, put pressure on, on governments or corporations to actually stop them. Um, so non-state and extra-state actors are often very concerned with monitoring these illicit activities that contribute to environmental degradation. Um, and of course, people participating in them go to really great lengths to try to keep them undetected. Um, so one contribution of the chapter is to, is to kind of show that these normative explanations of why illicit activities occur usually point to a lack of state enforcement of the rule of law. So basically saying, you know, states in Southeast Asia don't have the capacity to enforce these laws. But in Southeast Asia, state actors are often complicit, right? They take bribes to allow them to occur. Um, the political elites want them to go on so they can enrich themselves. In some cases, they're actually enriching the states themselves. Um, and this is all happening frequently in the absence of robust tax collection, right? So there's a lot of kind of financial incentive for these activities to be um, so-called sort of taxed under the radar, right, or kind of black market. Um, so this strategic support of illicit activities continues to kind of support state coffers, right? So we conclude um, by acknowledging that these new data infrastructures for environmental crime surveillance offer both possibilities but serious limitations. Um, these data infrastructures really disrupt the state's historic monopoly on data about the environment, which is a really significant turn, I think, in environmental politics. Um, but the ability of these infrastructures to actually change patterns of environmental exploitation and extraction are really a lot more constrained, right? Especially in the current 
kind of rise of you know, new authoritarian or old authoritarian governments kind of coming back to power. So to kind of wrap up and offer a few conclusions. Um, so we have a couple of conclusions in the book that are really about kind of further advancing what we're calling a political ecology of data. We call the chapter toward a political ecology of data. I would say now that the book is out, I'm like, we're there. We're not going towards it, right? We're just there already. Um, it's actually been really exciting to see how many articles are coming out now, like drawing on this framework and doing their own kind of case studies to show what's happening in the world. So a couple of questions we sort of raise and hint at, I guess, in the conclusion. One, what is the nature of data? Right, so I think we say that the authors question the substance and the context of environmental science um, and really question whether scientific data always gets it right um, or if it can reduce complex environmental problems to static categories, harming ecology and people in the process, um, and the role that data infrastructures might be complicit um, in, in doing some of that. Um, we also argue, of course, that data is the offspring of technological and social processes, um, always made within political and economic contexts. So the authors, I think, each on their own, but especially as a collection, show that data is inherently political. It's never neutral. Um, and the political economic context is especially important for showing who benefits and who is harmed by environmental data production, circulation, and analysis. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, leave plenty of time for questions, I think. So yeah, thank you for, for watching. Yeah, Kendra. How are you hoping that scholars will take up this work in the future? That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this is something I actually wish I had written more about in the conclusion. Um, I should mention we co-wrote the conclusion. Eric and I co-wrote it with Rebecca Lave. Um, she wasn't listed on the table of contents there. Um, so I think within political ecology, I think it's been quite evident, you know, just paying attention to some of these empirical cases, right, is something a lot of scholars are increasingly doing. But I think more broadly, I see this book as, as a potential real advancement on interdisciplinary research, right? So especially in the environmental sciences, right? So whether it's biological or earth sciences um, and social sciences or even humanities folks who work you know, on similar topics but from very different methodological and epistemological commitments, I feel like this offers a way forward, right? For people to actually be in conversation and say, okay, you're modeling, right? You're doing models, we're not modeling. But if we can come together and have a conversation about how the models are constructed, right, in ways that everybody kind of understands and is willing to engage with, that's actually a really novel way of approaching, I think, interdisciplinarity, right, in a way that hasn't always been um, interesting, right, to, say, scientists who haven't paid attention to those things. But I see there's a real shift going on in a lot of the sciences, right, of people becoming more aware of, you know, oh, we really better, like, question the assumptions that our models are built on or the data we're using. Right, so to have some of the sort of social scientists in the room saying, yeah, let's raise those questions and let's talk about it and let's do something different, I think um, is kind of a really ground up way to do, yeah, interdisciplinary work differently. So I would hope that people would do that. I'm starting to see some of it. I don't, I don't take credit for being their influence, but I think it's happening already and that's what we observed when we were putting the book together. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you, Jenny, for the talk. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I know a little bit about the research project you're about to engage with in terms of seaweed and generating your own data infrastructures. Can you talk a little bit about how that started to raise questions for you about what you should be asking and the endeavor itself? I imagine that having composed this book, which is very critical of a lot of the data construction, uh, what you're what you're seeing and what challenges you see ahead. So how do I use my own work in my future work? Yes. <laughs> Um, this is a fantastic question. I don't think I have an answer to that. Stay tuned for my next book talk, right, in five years. Right? Um, but I think this is, this is actually going to potentially be the best test. So basically, I've kind of proposed to do work with physical geographers, computer scientists, right, to actually write our own algorithms to look at kind of high resolution, potentially high resolution instances of seaweed habitat and environmental dynamics in Southeast Asia. Um, the empirical context aside, Part of why I wanted to work with these folks is the opportunity to do some of this in process, right? Is to say like, okay, I'm, I'm no computer scientist. I don't know how they write algorithms or even how algorithms work, but I think the best way to learn is to be on a project with them, right? Um, it's one thing to be able to do interviews, and I'm speaking from kind of a qualitative researcher who's done a lot of ethnography with scientists, but it's very, and, I, and I've done this, right? It's very different to kind of ask them questions about their process 
versus being alongside working, you know, working alongside them saying like, how are you doing that? Or why are you doing that? Or can you explain that to me, right? So I think methodologically, that's something I've become much more aware of since doing this book. Um, in terms of the questions I'm asking, I'm not, I'm not sure. Too early stage, but stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Jenny, I remember there was a time, um, maybe it was the 90s, where uh, getting remote sensing data was really, was quite hard. Governments weren't releasing it. It was like actually hard to get that, really hard to actually get that land cover. And that seems to have changed radically. Is that, in that sense that you can get it now, there's a, is that a democratization? I think you're suggesting it is democratization of that data, but then how are, you know, what's the relationship that states now have to that data? Are they just denying it? Are they, mm -hmm. how are they, how are they controlling? You know, because I can imagine it does cause them problems, but it seems like, or do they just not care anymore? Do they just spin it in a different way now? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. That's actually a question that Luis Alvarez Leon takes up in his chapter on the political economy of um, the sort of shifts in the satellite industry. So I think what's happened is that there's been, a, the private sector has gotten into the game, right? Basically through the tech industry. So there's a lot of tech startups now that launch their own satellites, right? The most prominent is probably um, Planet, right? It used to be called Planet Labs, where they, they have several hundred satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, doing kind of nonstop aerial photography, right? So it's it's remote sensing in a broad sense, but it actually takes high resolution photographs of the entire Earth's surface on a continuous basis. And this is this is for profit, right? So they make these things available to purchase, and the primary um, consumer of these products are corporations, right? Who are using uh, these photographs to monitor, you know, like I, I heard that like Walmart purchases them to track. Um, traffic into their parking lots, right? So they can understand, like, basically by, you know, like visitor visitor patterns on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Um, oil companies buy them, right? They'll actually surveil competitors' traffic of oil rigs and, um, you know, like container ship traffic, right, elsewhere in the world. I mean, it's this really kind of interesting phenomenon of, like, you can see anything in the world, right? Um, there's a couple of caveats to this, which I learned when I talked to Planet, like, a while ago which is that a lot of states, primarily the United States, right, being the kind of more, most powerful actor um, in, this, in this space, um, has put kind of a moratorium on the sales and even uh, viewership of, of particular places around the world. So basically, you can't purchase a high-resolution photograph of US defense sites um, and of, of other kind of random places, right? You also can't purchase imagery of Iran, um, of North Korea, right, of the places that the US determines as kind of like geopolitically sensitive. So the states, I think, do still have a stake in this, right, and are still controlling a lot of this. And they, of course, have their own satellites, right? It's more that I think the partnerships between states and scientists has kind of been ruptured from what it used to be. So it used to be the case that the only place you could go if you wanted to do remote sensing work, like 20 or 30 years ago, was like you had to either use Landsat data, right, which you could download for free um, from the NASA website. Um, or kind of offshoots of that, right? So you could purchase like slightly better quality data if you wanted to, but it was very expensive and it was very difficult to use. Um, and they, you know, at least with the US, they were always like pretty, um, pretty open about making that available for scientists, right? But again, the capacity, it required so much expertise and money to access it, right? Um, whereas now, I mean, you don't, need, you don't need the state to broker that, right? It's like you can purchase these things from companies, you can, get, you can get much better products from NASA, right? You can download a lot of data yourself for free. It, some of it's become easier to work with. Um, I think a lot more people have become just more fluent in some of the geospatial technology. So things like putting together um, the Global Forest Watch platform has like a lot of power behind it, right? They've got a huge team of researchers that are working on this thing continuously, um, making it available, available for people. So I think that's one of the questions that a lot of the chapters raise in the book actually is like, what's changed about the relationship to the state Right, or the relationship between the state and the data. Right? And in some cases, it's just true that the state is no longer the sole proprietor or producer of some of this data. In other cases, they're still a producer, but they're working alongside the private sector. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I am um, pretty novice to this, this topic, but I'm really um, interested in your Penguin vignette, mm. the whole story about that. And I'm curious if you have any advice on. Researchers that may be generating data that could be used in ways that they don't intend mm -hmm. to protect against that sort of thing. I don't know the details of how the, how they were able to use the penguin monitoring data for these other interactive pro uh, processes, but like, 
Uh, I could see a lot of examples of that. You develop something that's sort of an open source ethic and you want to make it available to people to, to use it and if it's, suddenly it's, it's used for other purposes that you didn't intend to make. Mm -hmm. Are there any sort of general takeaways from, from this type? Yeah, do you, do you produce data yourself of this type or? Right. I think it's a it's a great question, and I don't know that I have a great answer to that. Right. I think the book raises the set of questions you want to be asking yourself, right, as you're going through that process. Um, I mean, being you know, political ecology has never been a particularly prescriptive field, right? We're not in the advice business, um, so nothing in the book says this is what you should do. Step one, two, and three, right? Um, but it, it's really providing a way to think through some of these issues from the beginning, right, that maybe you hadn't even considered beforehand. Um, so I would say that's maybe the most valuable takeaway from the book is just a way to think, right, to think in new ways about how to approach that data, right, and the ethics around it. Um, I will say, like, data justice and data ethics is a kind of separate but very related conversation right now. Like, there's a lot of really great work coming out around data ethics and, and data justice, um, some of which comes from older work on environmental justice issues. Um, you know, so I would say looking to that and some of the frameworks people are putting out there. But but yeah, I mean, in the case of the penguin tracking um, uh, episode, you know, I, and I would encourage you to read the chapter. It's fascinating. The scientists knew they were working with the oil, co oil company, right? This was not a, a case of an oil firm like stealing data or anything. It was more that in a very remote place with a lot of data gaps, right? Both of, of wildlife populations, but also of, um, potential oil extraction sites, like they were working together to fill these data gaps, right? And it was all kind of in the name of, of increasing territorial sovereignty, um, you know, as the Argent Argentinian government has always been fighting against the British over sort of claims for this and, and claims to the oil itself. So it was in a pretty particular political economic context. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not satisfied with the answer I just gave you, but I would say, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think we have some online questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. So one of the chapters um, that talked about this, and I'm not going to go into it in detail. I don't know if this is work. Um, so in addition to the one about Zimbabwe that I mentioned, which I think is a great example of the process by which collaborative modeling can actually happen. Um, the other one that really talks about this is uh, the one that's the fourth one down here, Data Infrastructures, Indigenous Knowledge, and Environmental Observing in the Arctic. Um, so these authors, um, they're affiliated with the Snow and Ice Center at uh, UC Boulder. I think it's attached to UC Boulder. Um, and they, they basically were working with communities in the Arctic, so indigenous communities in the Arctic, to produce an alternative kind of environmental monitoring system, right? In a space where um, the kind of ownership of that knowledge has always been governments, right? It's like been, again, a very inaccessible place to do any kind of ground truthing. Um, it's been a sort of geopolitically sensitive area because it's now under some territorial dispute because the boundaries of the Arctic ice melts is not entirely clear. Um, and they were working with an indigenous community to build their kind of own remote sensing and data um, system, right, that was useful for those communities themselves. Um, so that's, I think, a really good example of how, you know, it was a successful sort of positive social justice outcome. Again, not, not perfect. They don't say that this was perfect by any means, but um, a way of kind of doing things differently than they had been, um, had been before. So yeah, I would encourage uh, whoever asked that question to check out that chapter. And that actually, that whole section in the book, I think, really points to the processes by which, um, you know, there are there are inroads, right, for, for better social justice outcomes if you're incorporating other people, right, in the process, right? So the disruption of traditional forms of expertise, I think, is really one of the things that these chapters are pointing to, right? Is like saying that it's not just scientists who have a monopoly on knowledge anymore, right? And I'm sorry, speaking to all of us who are scientists here, right? This is our business. Um, but it's actually, I think, a really exciting avenue, right? To be able to work with other people on the ground, other people elsewhere who, you know, traditionally would not have been included in any of these types of research or these types of knowledge production systems. Um, you know, there's there's easier and better ways to include them now, so. Is that what ground that's a great question. Ground, that is not what ground truthing is, but I'd love to tell you what ground truthing is. So ground truthing is, um, so if you have remote sensing data, right, so you're collecting 
uh, data generated by sensors that are somewhere else, right? Satellites, uh, airplanes, drones. Those things are basically detecting electromagnetic energy from the Earth, right? So it could be sunlight reflected. Um, things like ice, right, are very reflective. So that generates a different type of data than trees, right? So they're able to produce these like very relatively high resolution. I might, I'm probably gonna get these numbers. I don't do remote sensing myself, but like 15 meters by 15 meters now or 30 meters by 30 meters or some resolution like that. So you create these maps, right? Um, these quite high resolution land cover maps, but you need to go verify that what you're, you think you're seeing is actually on the ground, right? So the process of actually going to the place becomes really important, right? So it's not that you would need to ground truth the entire map or go to everywhere, because that's not the point. It's to make sure you have an example of each land cover class to kind of feed into your, your data model, right? So if you think you're detecting ice and you, you want to be able to verify that somewhere there was actually ice, right? So then the, the kind of corresponding data would also be showing ice. Yeah, so that's ground truthing. I think there was Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating talk, and I'm excited to read the book now, Jenny. Um, in the, in, I'm interested to know whether you've had much response from environmental scientists, because certainly uh, in collaborative work that I do, there's a lot of discussion around open access to data, a lot of discussion around data management, and you know, in many cases, governments are requiring that all of the scientific publications coming out of grants you're receiving government grants are open access and that the data is deposited in repositories that everyone has access to. So there's a lot of discussion about uh, data that wasn't true a decade ago even um, among scientists and thinking about um, whether it's needed to collect, how, you know, how it's managed, who has access to it. So I'm just wondering whether this opens a window for this broader discussion about the political and social implications of the data that they collect. Yeah, it's a great question and a great observation. I've noticed the same thing. I mean, the, the first question you asked is, um, what's the response for environmental science, the scientists been? Um, you know, surprisingly pretty, pretty good, I would say. Like, I've had quite a few environmental scientists. Um, you know, it tends to be the ones who were already thinking like this, but didn't have access to the right literature or the right people to talk to, right? So, you know, there, it's, I've, I've had conversations with scientists who are like, you know, this crossed my mind so many times, but I didn't have the language, or I didn't know how to ask the right questions, or I don't read in the social sciences, so I don't know how to think about this, right? So it's been a lot of that, which I think is great. And I will say we did work, I think, as hard as we could have to try to make the book as readable as possible to a broadest audience as possible, right? So it's not full of just social science jargon. Um, but I mean, your question, I think the more important question, right, is like, what do you do when there's now these new demands being placed on, um, on knowledge systems, right, of management, even production to management, to circulation to storage, to all of it, analysis even. So I think the conversation's kind of catching up, right? It's like these demands have been coming out, and now a lot of researchers are thinking through like, okay, what are the ethical frameworks that we should have in place to manage data, right, in a more just way? Um, I don't think that any of the chapters address that specifically, but I will say that a lot of people I know that have taken this up in recent the last year or two years are thinking about exactly that. So I actually think we're going to see a whole bunch of papers coming out in the next year or two addressing that, which I, that I hope are useful, right? But the problem, and not problem, but problem and opportunity is that you have to have environmental scientists participating in those papers as well, right? So they actually have to be willing to think through the ethical steps, right, of like thinking about a framework and putting it out there, right, which is often quite adjacent from the work they would normally do, you know? So I think, you know, finding the right people to go through that thought process together, but I do know of some papers that are in the work, so, yeah. Yeah, Jenny. Question from the online audience. Uh, from your point of view, how do you see data infrastructures shaping countries' responses to the COP15 agreements to preserve 30% of the planet by 2030 and the social justice implications of these responses based on data? Yeah, that's a great question. Can you read the first part again? From your point of view, how do you see data infrastructures shaping countries' responses to the COP15 agreements to preserve 30% of the planet by 2030? Yeah, so we also don't talk, we don't have an example in the book of that. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the COP meeting, right, the Conference of the Parties meeting, the, the most famous one is the one about climate change, but there's another one that's about biodiversity um, that just happened most recently in December in Montreal. And they, for the first time, really came to a global agreement. A lot of countries signed on to this to 
um, conserve 30% of the Earth's surface by 3030, right, for biodiversity conservation. Um, now, this is not a plan that sets out to like put a fence around 30% of the Earth's surface. That's not what it looks like. It's not practical. Um, but it's basically taking a whole portfolio of different conservation uh, apparatus, right, different types of interventions um, to try to target the right areas that will stem biodiversity loss, mostly through habitat protection. Um, and this can take the place in a lot of different spaces. So, I mean, how does this inform that? I think um, something I've seen that's pretty exciting, and, and this is something I've been working on with some people. I don't, I'm wondering if they're actually the person who asked this. I don't know. Um, but we've been working together with the conservation scientists to try to work through this, right? Because there's been a lot of epistemological difference around um, what's even driving biodiversity loss, right? Like what types of spaces should be conserved, right? Um, you know, is it valuable or viable to practice biodiversity uh, conservation in agricultural lands, right? Whereas a lot of like the kind of history of the, the, bio, the biological sciences, the conservation sciences typically ignored a lot of those spaces, right? They wouldn't consider an urban park, um, even if it had like a strong species population, um, as part of like a viable plan to conserve biodiversity. It was all about forests, right? Uh, mostly forests, but like kind of pristine nature, right? Trying to, uh, con you know, preserve pristine nature. So, I mean, I think data infrastructures can contribute to a lot of this by one, informing some of the platforms that are going to be distributing a lot of this information, right? So just the fact that an agreement was signed at the COP um, indicates that there's going to be a lot more data coming out about this, right? Like states need this information, NGOs need this information at, the, at a very minimum to monitor what's happening, right? Like are they upholding their end of the agreement? And this is not really different from the climate change agreement, right? Like after states signed on to the, um, the various climate change accords, right? Paris Agreement, for instance, um, there was like a whole industry that sprung up to monitor carbon, right? To say like, are states actually, you know, are they are they offsetting carbon, right? Are they emitting what they say they're emitting? Like there's a whole industry, a whole knowledge industry around tracking that. So I think we'll probably see something really similar with biodiversity, right? Like new platforms, old actors getting into new, um, like new technologies, right? Or new actors getting into new technologies um, to try to monitor biodiversity losses. Um, and doing some of that knowledge sharing. So, you know, I would hope the people that are kind of on the ground building some of these systems would think about these questions as well. But, you know, I mean, the, the larger the projects get, the more difficult it is, of course, right? Like, it's much easier to do something in a relatively small area, like the example from Zimbabwe, right? They weren't making a, a model, a collaborative land use model of the entire country even. It was really just a piece, right? It was a piece of the country. So, you know, if you're trying to do this for the whole planet, it's really quite complicated. But um, but yeah, I mean, all projects are ultimately local too, right? They all have to take place somewhere, so, yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm curious if there's any research that looks at like environmental impact of open source data versus the actual positive impact that it actually is supposed to be doing. Is mm -hmm. there any contrast between the two that's like one outweighing the other? Mm -hmm. so, like it's just a storage of open source data. Right, that's a great question actually. I don't know that we have an example of that. So are you asking um, if open source data needs to be stored somewhere that has an environmental impact, is that environmental impact greater than say proprietary data? Um, I don't know, I mean I can, I can kind of conjecture about what I did. <laughs> the use of the open source data, like the storage of it, mm -hmm. how, much, how many resources that it ends up taking that to store it, the information that's gathered from that have a positive environmental impact, is it more, like, is there more degradation mm. from the actual story itself? Like, is there any research mm. doing that? I don't know if there's any research. I've never looked. It would be fascinating to look. I will say that, um, you know, even open source data is still using Amazon servers, right? Like, pretty much everything, like, anytime you want to do something that involves the internet, right, if, especially if you're doing something large and open source where you need, like, reliable internet infrastructure, you're probably hosting it on an Amazon server, right? Um, an Amazon server is located somewhere, right? Often in other countries where, you know, it was cheaper or less regulated to try to build them. So, I mean, inherently, I, don't, I wouldn't say there's anything different, right? I mean, you could look at quantity, I guess, if you were gonna actually try to put some statistics behind this. Um, you know, like, if you're doing an open source project, does that mean there's more data, right, that needs to be generated and kind of stored over time to make it available? That could maybe lead to a broader environmental impact, if that's what you're referring to. Sounds like a project you should take up. Yeah. 
but yeah, I think that's a really great um, that's a really great question. I mean, these are these are exactly the sorts of things we want people to be doing now. You know, it's like I don't know. We haven't worked on that. I think that's yeah. These are all sort of avenues for future research here. Yeah, please. Um, so I'm really interested in the case study where you explore the monitoring of Jade industry in Myanmar. And as we like all know that because of a coup, now I assume a lot of those like data infrastructure monitoring projects have been suspended because there's no one, you know, on the ground who can coordinate with that. With that situation, are there any, you know, cope mechanism? For example, like, is it possible to use mobile data instead? But I also know, like, even for mobile companies in Myanmar, uh, a lot of those, you know, Western-owned company has been suspended. So, like, it seems like just, like, it's going to create a large gap in the data collection and even for the infrastructure itself. Just wondering what are some potential solutions? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think that's what makes this Myanmar case both, like, really heartbreaking, right, and also just really interesting. So we, you know, we wrote this chapter before the coup. Um, and uh, my collaborator on this, Hillary Faxon, is much more of a Myanmar expert than I am, so she would probably have a much more articulate answer to this. But, you know, first of all, I mean, this is sort of the purpose of remote sensing from the beginning, right, was to be able to surveil and monitor places at a distance where you couldn't have access to them on the ground. So um, for better or worse, I think remote sensing is still really useful in a context like this, right? I mean, if you want to be observing mining activity, right, to see is there is there like illegal jade mining happening in places you can see that pretty easily, right, from space, um, from either aerial photography, high resolution photos, or from remote sensing. Um, I think the bigger question is not just about data gaps, but it's like who could ever enforce these things, right? So just because you can see what's happening doesn't mean you can do anything about it, right? Um, and that's also the tragedy of a place like Myanmar, right, is that there are lots of eyes on Myanmar, right? A lot of human rights organizations have been tracking things there, like to back to the Rohingya crisis, like they were able to see a lot of these atrocities as they were unfolding in real time, right, genocides unfolding in real time, you can observe this from space. Um, but they were quite powerless to actually do anything about it on the ground, right, especially in that kind of political environment. So, I mean, that's kind of the conclusion of our chapter, right, is that it's one thing to be able to surveil um, or to monitor. It's another to be able to have any kind of legal enforcement, right, or to have actionable knowledge about them. So I would say, yes, there's absolutely data gaps. At the same time, I mean, Myanmar, in my experience there, is a very... Um, you know, they have one of the largest smartphone usages per capita in the world, right? Like over 90%, I think, of the country now has a smartphone. Um, and this is true in rural areas, too. I don't know what the current status of their internet infrastructure is, but basically after they kind of opened up as a democracy about 10 years ago, there were two international internet companies that came in and had contracts. And in exchange for building internet infrastructure in the cities, which were profitable for them, they were required to build out internet infrastructure in rural areas as well. Um, and this is one reason a lot of rural Southeast Asia is actually very well connected to the internet, right? So again, not if you're out in the forest, right, or you're far, but if you're in a village, right, even if there might be just a thousand people in the village and you're six hours from, you know, the nearest city or something, a lot of people there have access to the internet, right? So, you know, the ways that those things were playing out was like, for example, Facebook came in really early, right, to Myanmar and said, okay, if you want to access the internet, you're going to have to go through Facebook, right? So in Myanmar, Facebook was the internet which I think was a really, um, you know, it's a pretty dangerous way actually to approach the internet, right, through a kind of for-profit company. Like instead of having a Google search, right, which we also use, but um, they had to use Facebook, right? And that actually caused a lot of the conflict on the ground, right? The kind of like mismanagement, um, the, the lack of regulation around disinformation there. So yeah, I mean, I think these things are very much double-edged swords. You know, they can be helpful in some ways um, to track, but they can also be quite harmful. So yeah. Yeah, thank you all for coming. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you.